So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Howard Cox, who is a senior agronomist for the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries in Queensland. Howard has worked for the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries for 31 years, initially as an extension officer, and then in research and development roles. His interest in crop nutrition started in prior employment, working for a fertiliser company, but then continued after he undertook postgraduate study in that field. To add value to crop nutrition principles, Howard has used the crop simulation model APSIM to develop improved management strategies within several farming systems projects. Within other DAF and GRDC supported projects, his teams, the teams he's worked with, have developed a suite of web-based decision support tools such as Crop Arm, Nitrogen Arm, Fallow Arm, ARM. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Howard. These were better known as the old Whopper Cropper programs. An analysis tool for non-surface phosphorus fertiliser applications has recently been developed. Now Howard's brought along a wingman today, and most of you would be familiar with David Herridge, David Herridge, Professor David Herridge. David's here as a co-presenter today, but his main role will be uh, fielding questions that Howard would like to throw to David at the end. So David's here online and he may even have some comments to make during the presentation if he wishes. Uh, but Professor David Herridge, who's now with the University of New England, has conducted research for more than 45 years. <laughs> on N2 fixing legumes or nitrogen gas fixing legumes in farming systems involving basic soil microbiology through to plant physiology, agronomy and soil chemistry. Current research interests of, of David's are to develop tools for more efficient management of legume and fertiliser nitrogen in Australia's agricultural systems. Quantifying greenhouse gas emissions from and carbon footprints of legume N and fertiliser N dependent systems and improving legume productivity through the use of biological inoculants, including rhizobia. David was employed by New South Wales DPI for 42 years following a university traineeship, and he's been with the University of New England for the past eight years. He currently coordinates the Nat National Nitrogen Fixation Program for GRDC and led an ACR-funded international project on legume-based farming systems in Myanmar. And, uh Thanks everyone for joining in this presentation. I hope it's it's useful to you uh, in the end. Uh, this this webinar is uh, an output from the extension and training component of the national GRDC funded project, the More Profit from Crop Nutrition Initiative, and it's co-funded by those uh, organisations you can see at the at the bottom of the screen. So uh, that's has been uh, a range of projects that are are finishing up and ongoing at the moment. I'd particularly like to thank David Herridge for his input because this webinar draws heavily on the end budget calculator and the science that's behind it. I've really appreciated being able to get into it, pull it apart, look at it and and use it directly as well. And I hope you, know, you might be able to do that after this as well. And David will be online after to answer some questions. So the inspiration for this webinar mainly arose because of the situation in the last couple of years where we've seen some chickpea crops in particular that have grown a good quantity of biomass but were perhaps low yielding because of disease or insects or waterlogging etc. And so the question arose what is the potential end benefit in that situation? And also in general if I was asked over the years how much nitrogen a previous pulse crop would add into a farming system, I probably would have said anything from zero to 50 N, depending on the crop, maybe typically 30 or 40 from a chickpea crop um, and closer to zero for mung beans. So they're quite wide uh, windows of, of potential contribution and I was keen to be able to be a, a little bit more definitive uh, around that uh, contribution value. And there's been lots of research over the years uh, about uh, the contribution or the, end, the benefit for men, and it can be expressed as uh, a contrib direct contribution of nitrogen um, after the crop and after the fallow following the crop. And those ranges are probably in that range of up to 50, 75 of N. Sometimes it's expressed as a fertiliser equivalent 
so uh, so that how much uh, extra nitrogen on a on a cereal crop would be equivalent to the the previous pulse crop and uh, and again that's often up to a hundred hundred of n depending on the situation and there often definitely yield benefits following a pulse crop be, um, in a, into a cereal rotation. But as I said, uh, I'm looking at answering those two questions today and a couple of other things as well. We'll just look at the, a bit of the background on how to maximise the end benefit from a pulse crop and we'll, we'll use end budget directly to, to look at um, how much mineral N is likely to be at this planting of the next crop, in, uh, in other words, 2017 cereal crop after a pulse crop uh, from 2016, for example. And I'd like to present a couple of new rules of thumb that uh, have, have come out of using N budget, that after a normal crop, the N benefit is likely to be the grain yield of that pulse crop times a factor of 20. And after a, what I'm calling a semi-failed crop, or, or David calls in end budget uh, a green manure crop, the end benefit is likely to be roughly the biomass times a factor of 10. And I'll show you how those are derived as we go through. So soil testing, we're not saying that uh, soil testing is not useful. It certainly is, and it can work very satisfactorily and the lab results are almost invariably very accurate but the variability can come in with the sampling of the, the soil that goes into the labs and so um, that can cause some mixed results. There can be some seasonal quirks which can give some odd results from time to time um, in, in terms of the, the, the fallow and obviously soil sampling is is time consuming. So we're looking for is there an easier way to get an indication of the likely amount of N in a soil after a pulse crop and, and that's the whole purpose of, of N budget. To go from the pulse crop in question which might have been 2016, knowing the, the crop prior to that in 2015 which might have been a cereal with a certain amount of nitrogen on a certain soil type at a site and then looking forward to the next planting in 2017, uh, how much nitrogen is, is likely to be there. So the end budget itself has, comes with a, a manual, which is an, an absolutely excellent um, read on uh, the nitrogen economy in a farming system. It includes information on transformation, cycling, legumes, end fixation, fertilisers, and of course how to use the end budget calculator. It's sourced from 30 years of experimentation uh, in the nitrogen field and the, the science is explained very well in that manual and um, it's also referenced very well at the end. Uh, that experimentation comes from people like David himself, Harry Marcellus, Warwick Felton, Ian Holford, Wayne Strong, Ram Dalal, Greg Thomas, all those guys who've, who've worked in nitrogen over the years. So I'd really recommend getting that publication and reading it. it was a great refresher for me. It's available at that link on, at, you can see at the bottom of the page and should be available in the chat box over to the right of your screen as well. So well worth, well worth a read. The main point about N budget is it doesn't require saw testing um, as well. So that's a, a different, view, different aspect that David has created. If you want to get hold of the calculator, David is, is certainly willing to send a version to you. It would be great if it was online or as an app, but at the moment it's, it's not. It's, just, it's the... Uh, have to be the spreadsheet version, even though an online version was created. Um, so we've we've changed a few things in it to maybe answer that uh, semi-fail crop question, uh, but certainly 
grab a grab a hold of the the budget the end budget calculator. So just a quick review of the of the science aspects of this rather remarkable process of end fixation and how it may affect the decision making in the field. Uh, to be honest, I mean the the interest in pulses in rotation have come more about through their product value than their nitrogen contribution value. But of course, it's, uh, it is a free um, part of the, um, of the nutrient cycle. And if fertiliser prices again reach very high levels, then that, that end fixation factor will become even more important. But just looking at the key components here, the leg legume will remove a lot of grain, we know that, and that will have a, subs a large impact on the subsequent end benefit. It's not that you don't want high grain yields, of course you do, but um, the, the question will be how much end is going off in the grain relative to the, the biomass or the residue end that's going to be recycled, and, and that's the harvest index factor that we have manipulated. So growing a largest biomass practicable is, is important um, and the agronomy that goes into that is therefore important as well. Don't want to go over the top and grow too much biomass at the expense of, of the, the grain yield and um, there are factors that will affect that. But irregardless, if you've got good nitrogen fixation, which comes through effective nodulation, then the residues will be rich in nitrogen, obviously, and be recycled and create a net benefit to the subsequent crop. There will also always be a contribution of soil mineral N to the, the legume crop. It, it won't supply all its own nitrogen. And of course, it will influence the percentage of nitrogen fixation as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So it it um, it flows into the pulse crop, but also then is spared. Um, a portion is spared by the pulse crop, and it flows through to mineral nitrogen that's available to the next cereal crop. So it's a it's a it's a great system, um, and it, it's uh, economically, of course, it's the it's the uh, value of the grain crop and it's the value of the um, lack of fertile and fertilizer that's required for that crop, which can, can add up to some significant savings. So the end point is the, what's the end benefit? What's the soil mineral end at the starting of the next, start of the next crop? And that's what uh, we will work around today. So just, Looking at some of those factors which may affect nitrogen fixation, which is the free end component, inoculation is is important, and I think everyone would would agree that inoculating a crop is cheap insurance uh, compared to the, the the benefit that can be gained or the loss that may be incurred. So five to fifteen dollars a hectare uh, for the various types. Peat or freeze dried has been found to be okay if used in accordance with the uh, manufacturer's suggestions and Rowan Brill and and uh, others have tested that in New South Wales. The granular product is a more expensive product but doesn't have a, a time restriction that the peat material has and it's, it's I know it's extensively used in the west and uh, is becoming more popular further east. And obviously water injection works very well as well, but of course you need the, the equipment. So that's the, the important thing is that inoculation has to be um, sound to, to lead to uh, effective nodulation on the crop, uh, like this graph is now looking at, so that in a low rhizobia soil, uh, obviously, applying an inoculant uh, will increase the nodule numbers and quite logically flow on to a, a huge yield increase in, in the pulse crop. I'm, I'm sure everyone's 
familiar with that. Ideally, growing pulses should be in a, a low source with low mineral N to, to maximise the, the benefit of the N fixation rather than u utilising um, native soil nitrogen. So soils less than 50 kilograms of N per hectare at planting are, are ideal. Um, moving from 50 to 100 uh, of N in the soil can you see it shows a reduction of maybe uh, 20, uh, 20 odd or 40, 40 odd kilograms of, of N per hectare in the amount of nitrogen fixed. So the amount of free nitrogen basically is drastically reduced. Going out to 200 of N can see nitrogen fixation almost completely um, stopped. So the final composition of the, of the pulse residue may be the same, but uh, wherever the crop is planted, but it'll just be a juggle of how much that is fixed from the atmosphere versus how much was taken up from the soil. And you, you really want the maximum taken up from the soil. In terms of general agronomy, of course, nutrition um, should be adequate. Starter P and more recently deep P um, applications have been giving some good yield effects or yield benefits. There's some photos here from Doug Sands in central Queensland with a 40p rate um, showing a, a, a good increase in at least the biomass of a chickpea crop. You've probably heard Mike's, Mike Bell and Dave Lester's presentations a lot. So uh, that that is certainly an important factor and we're continuing our research and our um, extension effort around that. So keep an eye out for our DP calculator as well. Potassium is showing up, especially in central Queensland, and um, zinc can be important, but probably won't be an issue if you're using MAP zinc type products to, to fertilise either as starter or as deep P applications. Sulphur responses are pretty inconsistent. So plant populations, it seems like the current recommendations are okay. Just look for your district recommendations and same with planting times really. Um, not too early, not too late because too early you might grow excess biomass and exhaust the soil water. Too late you're likely to run into the heat, heat stress and that might reduce yield even though the nitrogen accumulated in the biomass will certainly be there and be re recycled, but that doesn't pay the bills very well. So just to reiterate the, the effect of narrower row spacings that um, the Pulse agronomy team have been showing, um, there seems to be a, a benefit in yield from going, going to narrower spacings, even down to uh, 0.25 of a metre but maybe half a metre might be a good compromise in many situations. So definite yield benefits there. And also Nikki Seymour's team has shown, shown higher fixation rates at the, uh, the lower, the narrower row spacing, spacings as well. And that's both in the percentage of nitrogen derived from the atmosphere and the total as well. So um, it's a, almost a, a double benefit there with yield and and fixation. Obviously there's a direct relationship between the plant biomass that's grown and the amount of fixed and in a crop all going well with nodulation um, and that relationship is probably around 15 to 25 kilograms of nitrogen per tonne of, of dry matter. But don't be distracted by that end fixed value because it's not the end game. The end game is really what's going to be in the soil after the pulse crop, after the fallow, at the start of the next cereal crop. The end fixation is the mechanism, it's the vehicle, but we want to use, in this case, end budget to show uh, the, 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 end, the net, overall net benefit from a pulse at the, at the next sowing time. And that leads me to part two of this presentation, is where we do these 
these calculations of the, the nitrogen benefit and develop those rules of thumb that I mentioned up the front. So there's three components of the, of the end benefit from the pulse. It'll be the soil end mineralised during the pulse crop. Again, our diagram here, um, the soil end that's, that's going across from the native soil end, uh, soil organic matter, that will form a, a part of the, the soil nitrogen at the start of the next cropping season. There's no doubt about that. And then there's the amount that's fixed in the in legume plant and, residue, and recycled through the residue. And of course, there's some that will be of the soil nitrogen that will be spared during that, that process. And the more that's fixed, the, the more that's spared. So here's a, a, a graph that's sort of showing the uh, components or the source of N at planting after a chickpea crop. So across soil, four soil fertility uh, points, uh, for a chickpea crop that's growing 2.4 tonnes to the hectare that had 50 soil nitrogen at planting, we're, we're just looking at where that uh, soil nitrogen at the start of the next crop may have come from. So N budget would say that it's likely to be 100 or 118 of nitrogen at the, at the next start of the next crop, ready for a cereal crop. Of that, 74 will have come from the soil directly. 24 will have been contributed by the chickpea biomass and 20 would have flowed through as, as unused soil nitrate. So that 24 of N out of the 118 is a 20% is a contribution uh, of the soil mineral end status at the next planting date from the chickpea crop. So that kind of sets the scene on, on how much um, is, is being added by a pulse crop, but we'll tease that out a little bit more in a sec. So that was with a, a cereal two years prior and with a bit of nitrogen applied and, and just the values directly from uh, the end budget calculator. Obviously, as the soil fertilities are different, more is going to flow through from the soil um, component as well. So, but I'll, I'll just kind of focus on a, a mid-range crop in, in most of these uh, subsequent slides. 118 um, from, from the previous crop. So there's a couple of ways we, we could have done this, but uh, we, the way we chose is to compare the soil end at the next planting from after a, a chickpea crop compared to after a typical wheat crop. And, and that's the way we thought most people in the field would, um, would be interested in. So it's using end budget directly includes the soil mineral end component. So this table is, uh, is uh, defining that, that soil mineral end at the next planting time based around four different soil fertilities that the chickpea crop was grown in and five uh, potential yield outcomes, three quarters of a tonne, 1.5, 2.4, etc. So I, this is the um, incorporating all those factors of residue and spared and soil and this is the likely soil mineral and uh, status at the starting start of, of the next crop, maybe 2017 in our case. Looking across those, uh, the sort of the mid-range values, we can see they kind of range from about 90 to 130 odd. Um, of mineral N at the at the next planting. So, if it was on a medium uh, fertility soil that had 82 when the chickpea was planted, which is a reasonable amount, then you would be expecting 116 at the next planting, which is quite a, a healthy amount. But we'll tease out how much extra benefit that is from the pulse. So 90 to 130 typical typical 
and at the next uh, planting. Comparing that to a wheat crop, same soil fertility range from very low to, to very high and an equivalent yield of the wheat crop. So we're saying that the, the, the chickpea crop would have yielded about two thirds of a equivalent wheat crop. So uh, this column here corresponds with the 2.4 tonne chickpea crop producing 10.5% protein, it, maybe it had 75 of N added. Now that, these are all uh, changeable within N budget, you can do your, the scenarios yourself. So the soil mineral land at the next planting is likely to be these values, which you can see are quite a bit less than for the pulse crop. So they're mainly in the range of 40 to 120, depending on the soil fertility and how much the, the, the wheat crop would have extracted. And so obviously that's going to vary with a fertilizer addition and a, a grain protein outcome. So that, that range, 40 to 120. And of course the main difference is that the pulse, because of its low carbon to nitrogen ratio residues is, is releasing nitrogen whereas a, a wheat crop is going to be at least temporarily tying up uh, nitrogen for the microbial biomass. And that worked out at about seven kgs per tonne of grain, which to me coincides with my understanding of, uh, of end tie up as well. So a little, uh, uh, quite a bit less likely after a wheat crop, perfectly, perfectly logical. And so the difference between those two uh, values between what would be after a chickpea versus after a wheat is shown shown here. And that difference across the range of the, the yield scenarios um, is somewhere between 20 and 70 kgs of nitrogen per hectare. So that's a pretty broad range as you'd expect and it's all depending on the balance between the, the yield of the chickpea versus the yield of the wheat and the, the nitrogen fertilizer added to the wheat, the soil fertility, etc. So, so that's a pretty broad range. But if, you, if we focused on this mid-range yield situation, the average is around 44. So, you know, 40 to 45, 35 to 45 is a typical sort of extra benefit of the chickpea in that system compared compared to wheat. But the range is quite wide. So we're starting to target in a little bit on, on their understanding of how much it's likely to contribute. And then this is the uh, rule of thumb that has come out of looking at this uh, difference between the, the two. So I'm calling it the end benefit factor of kilograms of nitrogen per tonne of chickpea grain. So all that is, is, is taking that difference between the contribution of the chickpea versus the wheat, dividing it by the yield of the chickpea crop, which you obviously will know from the paddock, and seeing what the multiplication factor is. And looking across the, the mid-range here, you could argue that it is the multiplication factor is roughly 20 kilograms of nitrogen per tonne of chickpea grain. So if we look at the mid-range crop again, a, a 2.4 tonne per hectare crop of chickpea times 20 will give an extra 48 kilograms of nitrogen compared to a, a, a rather equivalent wheat crop. So that's the rule of thumb that's uh, dropped out of that. This is for a normally yielding chickpea crop across a reasonable range of yields. Um, it's not perfect, that factor, that um, rule of thumb, but uh, it could be a, a starting point for your calculations. So what happens for this, what I'm calling a semi-fail crop, when the grain yield is much less than expected maybe the biomass is as expected, what happens to the, the benefit at the starting point of the next crop? So went through the process again, but with a much lower harvest index, 
So the same soil fertilities. This time I'm basing it on the biomass of the crop because the yield outcomes at those sorts of in those situations can be quite unreliable. But um, we're just looking at a general harvest index of 0.15. So the biomass of the the semi fail crop being two, four, six, eight or ten. What is the the nit nitrogen position after that crop and after the fallow? It's uh, these values here in this range. So we would have would obviously logically expect it to be higher than for the normal crop because we're only pulling off essentially much lower yields um, of uh, of this situation. So the, the, the soil mineral land is mostly in the range of 110 to 155 in this sort of, let's just focus on the more typical situation of on a low to medium soil, etc. The normal crop was 90 to 130 um, and the, the, the range of the difference was 10 to 25. So expecting an extra 10 or 25 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare if the crop is low yielding for whatever reason occurs. So skipping straight to calculating that uh, rule of thumb in that situation again, but this time basing it on the biomass of the, of the previous chickpea crop, the the factor or the rule of thumb factor drops out to be close to 10 kilograms of nitrogen per tonne of chickpea biomass. And so maybe that can be a starting point as well. Not so, it's, I'm, say, I'm not saying that it's easy to estimate or measure the biomass of a, a chickpea crop. You know, it's sort of, it's one of those, uh, those tricky, tricky things, but um, it might be a starting point and, uh, and there's your rule of thumb, 10 kgs of N per tonne. So drawing towards the end of the, the presentation now, estimating biomass, yes, it's tricky. And these are some photos of some very high end yielding crops. I'm sure you've, you've all looked at, uh, at lesser yielding crops. And the only real way to, to be able to get a biomass estimation would be to do quadrat cuts. But I don't know, in the future, we might be able to have a photo scheme of, of biomass values or something. But yeah, it's, uh, it's not a perfect system, but it's, uh, it's just one way of estimating a, a, a nitrogen contribution using those rules of thumb. So I just did a check with Faber Beans and how that compared uh, in the same situation and they were not greatly different to the nitrogen benefits from chickpeas. Maybe contributing a little bit more uh, at the higher um, soil fertility uh, points and uh, that's uh, just a, a difference within Faber Bean because it, it sort of spares more nitrogen um, compared to chickpea, but essentially quite similar to the nitrogen benefit from chickpea. So to summarise, um, the difference in soil mineral N uh, following chickpea compared to a, an equivalent wheat crop is going to be in that range of 20 to 70 kilograms per hectare, depending on soil fertility and yield. For a mid-range mid chickpea yield crop, end budget will say it's in the 30 to 40 kilograms nitrogen per hectare and 10 to 25 kilograms more if it's a, a semi fail crop. And those rules of thumb again, for a normal crop, the nitrogen benefit's likely to be uh, the grain yield times 20 and for a semi fail crop, uh, the biomass times 10. Not a bad starting point, perhaps. So armed with those sorts of figures, what can you do? Well, you can, you can obviously, every situation's different. You can use end budget directly 
to input uh, your own region, obviously, your own previous crops, nitrogen rates, etc., and, and get the get the the actual value yourself. Uh, it works for some, it's available for summer crops as well, and it's not just pulses. Obviously, it includes all the cereals, canola, sunflower, uh, in the rotation analysis. That rule of thumb is there for a starting point, and then ahead you can choose consider that pulse as a bonus or perhaps if that value is moderately high, that potential end benefit is moderately high, um, 40 or 50 or something, you may be choosing to reduce fertiliser rates a little bit and keep a little bit extra in the, little, the other bit in the bank. It's, it's really obviously a decision between a, an advisor and a grower on what to do in that situation. But, the pulse end's always going to be there. It's it's part of a, a free contribution. It's uh, it'll be stored for the next crop or lost by denitrification if that's what happens. Uh, but yeah, you may be able to reduce the fertilizer rate a little if you choose to do so based on some some um, calculations. Obviously, you can retest the soil closer to a planting if there's some unusual situations and you're not quite sure and just doing it well is the important bit. So some other resources that you may want to read. Uh, there's a, a really good booklet on inoculating legumes, the guide, and I'm happy to send that out obviously. And <clears throat> our own nitrogen book which uh, is a, is a, a summary on uh, the supply and demand and losses and gains of nitrogen in farming systems and other nutrients as well, like pasture legumes, etc. And associated with those are these calculators that uh, Luke mentioned uh, at the beginning. We're just about to re-release some of these as web-based tools uh, called Agricultural Risk Management Tools, Crop Arm, Nitrogen Arm, etc based around the old Whopper Cropper and the DP calculator. Worth having a look um, on the web. I'm sure we'll, we'll, be able to, we'll be advertising when that's available and it won't be too long in the future. So have a look for those as well. So thank you for um, joining in. I hope it's been a benefit.